Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We have a great show for you today. We have actor-producer Josh Richmond and designer-ceramist Lori Gates. Josh Richmond produced four music vid videos for the band Guns N' Roses, including Don't Cry, which he co-wrote, and Live and Let Die, which he directed. He's worked in films and on television. No newcomer to the business, Josh Richmond started on the radio at the age of three. Welcome, Josh. Nice to see you. Thanks. <laughs> How did a child at the age of three get started on the radio? I had the super uh, post-nasal drip and a great art for mimicry. Did so you? They, were, they would say the line, I'd come back, and I'd be like, it would be this teeny <laughs> little kid <laughs> saying these really adult sort of things and this great post-nasal drip. And I used to do Kmart commercials, and when I was 12 and they thought my voice was going to change, they banked like 50 of them. And of course, I didn't go through puberty until I was about 40, so <laughs> I got lucky and made a lot of money. Where you are now, right? Yeah. At 40. <laughs> How long did that last? Does it last until your voice changes? Is um, that the idea? When or? you're a kid, depending on the nature of your voice, yeah, I mean, it can last forever. If I would have pursued it, it would have lasted forever. I just... I didn't. I don't like driving places, so I but, didn't go to auditions. But I think at three years old, how well, are you, you know, driving? You, you go. You go to your like 15, 16. Your voice changes, and then you have as much work behind you as I had. You start going on these voiceover calls, and they're like, "This kid's brilliant." Wow. He's. A, I was a child star on the radio. Right. I won Clio's and IBA awards, and you know I don't even have them. I was just gonna say, I know you won awards, so those Lots, things yeah. were playing all the time. All I the guess. time. Christine Applegate, when she was about a year old, she and I were Mr. and Mrs. Goofproof on Kmart. You pay only for the prints you like. Is that right? Yeah, for about oh, five years. Oh, goof proof. Oh, yeah. That was us. <laughs> Thank you. How did you move then from radio where no one saw you and you were really behind the scenes into acting? Um, well, I guess, you know, some would say that is acting, but uh, <laughs> I went, I wanted to have a normal childhood, which I did. I had friends going on auditions in high school and I didn't. And then when I got out of high school, I spent about a year and a half shooting guns and being mean. And I decided that... Uh, was that all on the freeway? Yeah, that was on the freeways <laughs> of L.A. I'm the one that got busted. I just got out of jail. No, they, uh, <laughs> they said, everyone around me said, you're a good actor, you should... So I, when I was like 19, I got an agent. I went and got some calls, and I did a V. V was my first TV show. I saved the world, and Mark and Mindy's dad, Conrad Janis, was my dad. It said Matthew Broderick type, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> but that was my first job, and it went from there. Yeah, but did you take any acting classes? I did, but that's not acting class to me is a joke. I think if you, if you, if you have if you have it as an actor, then you go to class and you hone your stuff. If you think you need to prepare for a role, then you go into class. But being in class, it's like therapy. It's like if if you know if you don't get along with your teacher or the style of the class, just like a therapist, then you it might take you a couple months to figure that out, and then it's too much of your soul you've put into it. So I I think auditions. If you're going to be an actor, go out, do your auditions, get work, do good work, do things with your friends. Acting class is a weird, like, cultish thing. But how do you know? How do you know what auditions to go to? And how do you get an agent if you haven't gone to acting Here's classes? what you do. <laughs> it's dissertation on acting. <laughs> acting is a joke. Being an actor is a beautiful thing if you can work at it, but 99.9% .9 of the people are professional auditioners, not actors. They're auditioners, you know? And what you do in your audition, you have to tell them you don't even do it in your, when you get the job. So, and your humility just takes a douse. So I don't really know if being an actor is something that I that I wouldn't in, tell anyone they should go and do. To tell you the truth. Well, I've known you for years, and when I first used to see you on the strip or at clubs, you used to come in with your cane. You're behind the eight ball My now, girlfriend. right? My girlfriend. Is this your girlfriend? <laughs> and you would always be barefoot, or you'd have some socks on. Always. Actually, socks. Yeah, for about five years. And what was that scene? I feel like I'm in a club right now. No. <laughs> um, what's this? What are these? What's the code? No, exactly. I, uh, the, yeah, I was, um, this? This is just got out of the loony bin. No, I'm just joking. I, um, I think it was regimentation at the time. I was in high school. I hated my style. I hated my shoes. I got to school, stopped wearing them. Then I think it became a defiant thing. I don't know, but 
when it came back to shoes, I don't know, maybe I thought it was a superhero. I, mean, I used to wear leggings and straight to socks, and I thought it was like a universal superhero, you know? It was great, know. because we would like to, here comes Cher, let's photograph Josh and Cher together. He doesn't have shoes on, and you go, what is this? This is pretty weird. Remember that? <laughs> I do. And I wasn't friends with her then, and I kind of know her a little bit now, and uh, she asked me the same, she asked me about all that. Does too. she? Does mm -hmm. she remember when well, we were remember, you were weird, and you're strange, and what do you do? Everyone's always like, what do you do? I'm like, I just hang out. Yeah. And they see my name on something, they're like, they saw me as an actor, people in clubs, and they'd be like, how'd you get that? Like, someone met me in a club and gave me an acting job in River's Edge or something like yeah. that. You know? What other movies were you in? I was in River's Edge and Heather's. I was the only ornamental degenerate in both. Um, I did a bunch of other garbage, did some good TV stuff. You know? The TV stuff is what I was going to talk about next, because you did 21 Jump Street. Yes, I did. Did I you did. do a lot of those, or did you do? I did a character for three years. I did two a two-part episode, and I was such an evil little man that they loved me, and I was such a crack selling, gun-toting, car-stealing, Johnny Depp-defying guy. <laughs> and by the by the last season, they, they wanted to do a Juveniles on Death Row episode. And so they oh. brought my character back, <laughs> and I ended up going to the, to the to lethal injection chair for Rosie Perez's crime. Is that right? That's and we're right. going to see a clip of that, or are we going to see when an we outtake? See we're going to see it now. Okay, it's an outtake. It didn't make it in the show. It's where the warden is asking me, since my mother's dead now, what the arrangements are going to be made for, you know, for after I, I blip, blip, blip. And uh, I don't know. I guess it's time <laughs> so to go. We'll, <laughs> we'll see at 21 Jump Street. I heard some things <laughs> about what happens to you. And, uh, it's just... I don't want to look dumb or weird after. You just make it look like I'm asleep. And I don't want to be burned. Cremated. Yeah. I don't want that. Where would you like to be buried? drawn to have that kind of a thing going on. Someone asked me that earlier. You draw on being a good actor. <laughs> but um, you didn't go to acting school. No, I did, but it didn't <laughs> help. No. That, that's just, you know, if you're a real actor and you're in the moment, and especially if the source material is good, it'll be there for you, you know, if you're in touch with yourself. Then why did you want to move from acting into producing? And how did you get mm. into these uh, Guns N' Roses videos? Well, I was good friends with Axel. And he was Axel Rose. Yeah, Axel Rose. And he was getting <laughs> rid of his manager, who was make who made all his videos. And he said, "I want you to make my videos with me." And I said, "I, I, I." And of course, like anything else, like the Gemini I am, I just went and did it. And we made a million and a half dollar video the first time that was really successful, Don't Cry. And I storyboarded it with him. We wrote it together. I directed it on paper, basically hired the people and they executed a video that's basically still sitting in my house on paper. So it's like, I at least got to see that I could create something on paper, put it on the screen. And that's what got me into producing. Because I really wanted to get out of being an actor because I was an auditioner, not an actor. I never got to do good stuff like that all the time. So know? they really had to take a chance on what you could do. Yeah, everyone hated me and resented me quite a bit during that time. When you were first starting or after you made the hit? Well, or, yeah, right after. I mean, they had slash. to take a chance on saying, Josh can do this. Axel said it. No one else believed it, but we did it. You know, people were kind of afraid to say no to him. Slash, who I had been good friends with, said to me, mm. I don't know what's going on here. And by the end, he's like, hey, man, you know, we all gave you a lot of hard times but I'm really proud of you did a good job and that was I felt better after that don't cry video and the creation of it and what I had done on it and being the boss and whatever else than I did after any acting job ever but you also wrote when you wrote live and let die no I directed it yeah oh you directed it, was, it, was, it. Oh, yeah, I directed sorry. it from 34 live clips it was just fun it was experience in the editing room it was cool you know 
The other thing that b before we leave, because we want to get everything in, you've done so many things, you produced The Last Party with Robert Downey Jr. How yeah. did you get into doing something like that? Well, I wanted, uh, I wanted when I saw Steven Soderbergh make <clears throat> Sex, Lies, and Videotape at 27, I wanted to make a movie at 27, too. Wanted to go to the convention, uh, needed a reason, told Robert I wanted to do this idea. We want to just go and talk about truth and honesty and, inform and put information out there in 92. Hopefully like Haskell Wexler's uh, uh, Medium Cool in 68. But tell us the convention, because you, you covered both conventions. Yeah, we covered both conventions. It's just a symbiosis between like Robert growing up in the country having to get awake and change things, outmoded beliefs, dying. You know? The presidential convention. Yes. Yes, the, oh, because we don't know what we're I talking yes. about we on the We went to the RNC party. and the DNC, Bill Clinton, of course, being the nominee there and George Bush, the nominee in Houston. And it was quite interesting. And the clip we're going to show from that is from a Planned Parenthood rally in Houston. I mean, we came across all kinds. So we let's see it. Okay, cool. Let's see it. They call themselves Planned Parenthood. They're an abortion mill. They are, do not plan parenthood, they plan death. That's right. Amen. I agree. The Bible says that the shedding of innocent blood is an abomination to God. And I submit to you that that's what you do every time that you murder an unborn little baby. Every time you kill a little innocent one, you're killing Jesus. You know better. Your mother taught you better, sent you to Sunday school, look at you. You're doing wrong and you know it. You are not going to be able to stop people from having abortions, but, but the difference is, is that if you guys have your way, there will be a lot more illegal abortions, and therefore there will be a lot more women dying we from stop, unsafe abortions. We cannot stop sin in any fashion. There's a, a spiritual warfare that's going on between God and Satan. Satan is on that side of the street saying, Who get out God? there. Who is, who is God? Is he God is the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, yes. Mommy, mommy, why did you kill me? Mommy, mommy. This is like um, good documentary stuff. Yeah, very much Where so. do you see yourself going with, well, as this is a stepping stone? Got into making movies and making things because I want to put myself in the movies I make later. <laughs> but I want to be an actor. I just don't want the whole routine. So now that I've made a feature film, I'm going to go make more. I'm working with some friends of mine right now. Bought some books, making some projects, writing some scripts. You know, I have a lot of friends that are A-list actors who all want to work with me. So, you know, I'm going to go make some movies, put myself in them, and be an entrepreneur. Well, I, I also did five <laughs> weeks on Oliver Stone's new movie, Natural Born Killers. Tiny little part. Did you? Yeah. But the thing is, when you say you get these people to be like in the last party, they're all friends of yours. Yeah, Rent I mean, us a list of these names who were on there, and then we'll say goodbye. No, that is ill. I can't start naming <laughs> off names. But what I can say is that you work, you live in a city, you be yourself, you meet people, birds of a feather. You know, a lot of my friends made it really large as actors, and now they want to make movies together. So I'm lucky. Okay, I'm lucky too. Thank I'm you lucky. For I knew you. I knew it. Your house is the only house that's as cluttered as mine. <laughs> I'm happy you were with us today. Thanks. We'll be right back with Lori Gates. Don't go away. Hi, I'm back with ceramist designer Lori Gates who was born and raised in Alberta, Canada. He was a biology major at the University of Alberta and spent time as a farmer. Lori, <laughs> how did you get from the farm to ceramics? Well, it was a bit of a long road <laughs> down. <laughs> uh, I started uh, selling um, glassware, art glass, uh, to accounts across the country out of Los Angeles here and did a lot of design work for those companies. and. Uh, it led me into working just into the design field. Like old art glass or new art glass? New, new <coughs> but in the old styles of Tiffany and our other Art Nouveau um, artists. Uh -huh. And uh, then one of the factories that I also became involved with was a ceramic factory, and I really had no idea at the time that I would um, design for that line. Um, people changed in the company, and I started designing for the, for the factory 
and then actually became involved working on specific projects for um, stores across the country. Was that L.A. Pottery? It, yeah, at the time it was Design Craft. It's now L.A. Oh. Pottery. I own the company now. I see. It was Design Craft. But right. did you go to art school in between? No. I, as, as you said, I was... <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Not specifically. I've worked in the, uh, previously with people like Noburo Kubo, who's a master potter from Japan third generation actually and that was a very rich experience I learned a lot from him so were you like an intern in the studio is that well I worked off <coughs> and on as an intern and also as a student oh, of I see. his uh, and Fred Owen as well from Vancouver Canada um, he's also part of my past and really didn't think I would ever be doing this myself, but I am now. You are. Yeah. And before we go yeah. any further, uh, they kept saying Lori Gates. They were telling me Lori Gates. Do people get confused with your name? I thought I was going to see a woman. What's the origin of that? That's actually Scottish. I thought yeah. maybe My so. grandfather's from Scotland. So that's what it is? <laughs> that's it's right. your real name, Lori? Lori Gates, yes. Yeah. Um, once you started working in ceramics. Did the designs come easy? Where was your inspiration coming from? Well, as I said, I'd been working with design in glass, and uh, to me, glass is a medium of light, and actually, ceramic is coated in glass. That's what a glaze is. So the colors really come to life uh, if they're applied in certain ways underneath the glass. It really brings it to life. So do we have to worry about any metals being in the glaze? I know we wine bottles that were mm -hmm. um, capped with with tin. Was it tin or some kind it of metal? Lead. It was lead. It was a lead foil. So is there uh, lead in? Um, no, you won't find any lead in this product. But it is something that is in some products, but not out of Los Angeles. What about? Does the government control it at all? It's very heavily controlled. Yes, it's monitored very closely. Do you know how to mix glazes? Is that absolutely? Oh, you do. Yes, I spent hours down in the, our little lab playing with colors and glazes. So, how big is your factory? Twenty-four thousand square feet. Yeah. Here, here in West Los Angeles. Uh -huh. And then what happens in that factory? Well, we start with raw clay. We have our own special recipe for our body, and we mix it with water, and then we screen it. We form it, and we have two methods of forming our pieces, with hydraulic presses and also by uh, pouring a liquid slip into molds. So do we have a mold here? We don't have a mold, but what this is, is a model. Let's this is a plaster of Paris model of a new plate design. And it was done from a sketch and, and then carved in the, in the plaster. From this, we make a master impression die. Do we use this? Should sure. I bring this yeah. to you now? This is the finished plate. This is the actual new plate, glazed in white. Let's hold it this this way okay. and see if you can get it like that. That's the finish. It won't be any other color. It'll always oh, be. This is a new piece for the factory and I can guarantee you it's going to have lots of colors on oh, it. Well. I already, <laughs> this is brand new today. It came out of the kiln this morning. Ah, um, Everything from what I see um, and, and the factory it's a commercial factory, but are there one-of-a-kind pieces coming out of there? Yes, there are. There always are. Uh, we also do tiles, custom tiles. This morning, before oh, I came I over see. to see you, I was out at a project that we're doing in the valley, uh, a new pool completely done with custom tile work, and we're coordinating with matching dinnerware for the backyard for these people. Oh, that sounds great. That was another thing I was going to ask you. When you're designing or uh, coming up with your designs, do you think of food? for each plate, or do you have a favorite recipe that you think of? Well, there are certain colors that food does not look good on. Really? What yeah. are those? Tell well, us. Well, some of the green, green tones, I greeny wonder. blue tones. It's not real nice to eat off of, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, everyone has their own taste. So the, the beauty of doing, being able to work with as many colors as I do is that you can offer a lot of different uh, choices to people. And, and who um, sells your dinnerware, or what do we call it? Dinnerware, or do we just call it ceramics? What do well, we? Well, it it's all ceramics, and it's more than dinnerware because there's a huge cookie jar line as well that I do. Oh, Lots tell us of about fun that. Items. We, uh, in the cookie jar area, it's, we have a pig family. I don't know if that's because <laughs> of my farm background. That's what I, I was wondering where the farm, the farmer part of you came out. Well, these are in a lot the easier jars? to keep clean. Than <laughs> <laughs> in the cookie jars, it, it came out. And also in some of the designs, because farming actually paints kind of a palette on the land. 
you know, with the plowing. And the color wise? Color wise, and um, I think it sometimes emerges in my work. I know, I, I noticed in one of the things you gave me, it said there was a, a mouse shaker. Yeah, is that that's right? That's a fun little item. <laughs> is that, what is that? That's it's actually shaped like a mouse. He looks like a little mouse holding a piece of cheese, and uh, he holds cheese inside. Now, if we went to, where could we go to buy something like that? Well, William Sonoma uh, carries the line, and Nordstrom does a large business with our pasta bowls and uh, mouse cheese shakers. As a matter of fact, this year for Christmas, they're introducing the mouse dressed up in gold. We've done a special pattern for them. And, and in some of this is gold. Uh, is this 22 karat gold? Yes, it is. It's. Uh, an extra process that goes into the pieces where the gold is painted on and it's fired a third time. And we don't have to worry about the metal in that? Oh no, gold is perfectly safe. It's perfectly yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, So go on. Harrods, I think, uh, sells your things in Europe. Yes, uh, we do big business in Great Britain. They really like the California look. The uh, colors are bright and happy. The patterns are pretty, and uh, we do a lot of business now over there. Now, would your pieces be collectible, say, like a Clary Cliff or Bower Ware or Fiesta Ware from the 30s and 40s and 20s? Yes, it is. Are actually. There, is it collectible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As if you go into some of the uh, antique shops and quote junk shops in Southern California, <laughs> you can find pieces that come out of this factory from a long time ago. Out of this factory? Right. Are they signed on the back? How do we know? That was another thing I wanted to ask you. Every piece is signed. Is your it's name on it or yes. is the factory name? Both. Can we Los see? Angeles is there pottery. something on the back of that, of one of these plates? Well, I don't know if you can see this, but this teapot, by the way, was com I was commissioned by uh, Bendel's in New York to do a gold tea service for them for this Christmas season, and this was the piece they selected. Let's see if we can turn it over and, and let me see. Oh, it is. It's very tiny. I don't know if we can see that, but it says, oh, Lori Gates, Los Angeles, Los Angeles Pottery. pottery. Mm -hmm. So people will look for that and perhaps just start collecting it. Well, they actually are now. <coughs> it's funny. I get calls sometimes from people <coughs> looking as to where they can find Lori Ware. <laughs> where they can find Lori <laughs> Ware? Oh, so that's great. I actually, I hope that name doesn't stick. <laughs> um, since we're talking about one-of-a-kind or collectible things, I know some of the museums carry your work. Yes. Museum shops, I should Museum say. Museum shops do, <laughs> yes. They, um, one of the most popular pieces is the pasta bowl, and that's this shape down here to my left. Oh, I see. And it's because it's really big. Can yeah. you pick it up and show it to us? Yeah, it has a very nice shape to it. Ah. Uh. And then here's that green, though, that you were talking about. The red, probably, red pot, red sauce on the pasta. Looks probably. very good. Looks good and on that. to tone down the green, I put in black into the green. Oh, so I see. So it kind of warms it up a little more. When you farmed, did you have uh, apple orchards, or is this just part but of your nature? Too cold <laughs> it in was, Canada is for it? apple orchards where I live. Yeah. Um, when you were also talking about glass, um, I think you you helped put together an exhibit for the Dallas Museum? Right. A few years ago when the O'Keeffe exhibit was traveling across the country. Tell us what the O'Keeffe exhi exhibit is. It was a retrospective of some of the major pieces that George O'Keeffe had painted, and it traveled um, to major centers, uh, like Los Angeles and New York and What Dallas. kind of pieces? P her paintings. Oh, they were her paintings, mm -hmm. and, and then how did you get involved in well, it? Well, they, they phoned me, and because I worked uh, with the glass artist, they asked me if we could put something together that would be a nice companion piece to the exhibit. So what we did was designed, um, Matt Quinn is the artist, the glass artist who actually blew all of these pieces, and we did the Chinese poppy, which is, I think, one of her signature pieces, and it certainly was for that exhibit. This and is um, George's signature piece. Yes, definitely. The the uh, big poppy. Chinese poppy. Yeah. And then actually, this piece is blown. It's all blown. And it's signed. I see on mm -hmm. the back. Right. This is actually. How do the they first put the flower in there? <laughs> <laughs> well, that process is actually building with colored molten colored glass, layers upon layers of molten. And the flower glass. starts in the middle, mm -hmm. and then Each it just keeps. Each petal is built separately. And, and then, then the applied glass separately, and then it's built up with the clear glass over top. Would you ever go into just um, 
making, say, a dinner set that would go with this? Or have you done it? Or Not yet, but in November in New York at the Tabletop Show, I'm introducing a line of hand-painted uh, stemware and barware. Oh, so you are going into mm -hmm. glass. And yes. w will it be like this, or will it be like this? No, it'll be more traditional uh, dining room wear. Mm -hmm. Well, is that kind of thing collectible, dining room wear? I mean, does that get like very commercial or? I think a lot of people collect dinnerware uh -huh. and bakeware. I think in a lot of kitchens you'll see displays of pieces, particularly ceramics, because you can do so many interesting things with ceramics. Does the idea of, um, you're talking about a tabletop show, I know many places in many cities do that in museums and as a, a way of fundraising they do table. Do, do you put the whole thing together? The t the um, the linen, the flowers. Does that all come as part of what you're doing? Definitely. I ha I'll have three tables that I'm doing in New York, plus four display racks. And what influences you on that? Just what you think is the newest thing going? Uh, well, there are all kinds of. In a commercial line, you have to be able to respond to what people want. But uh, also, it's what I like. So what you out. like, <laughs> before we go, I know the other night you mentioned that you have a son in school here. Is he an artist willing to follow in his father's footsteps, well, or is he a farmer? <laughs> I don't think he'll be a farmer, and I'm not sure he'll do ceramics, but he is studying design and psychology. So it's a toss-up now wh which way he's going to go, is but it? he'll go his own way. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Would you ever think of going back to school now and learning how to do some other processes? Absolutely. Yes? Absolutely. What, what one thing would you really be interested in doing? Um, I, I'm going to take a course in slump glass dinnerware. And Whatever that, that is, project. tell us very quickly what slump glass is. Slumping glass is heating, it in a heating glass in a kiln over a mold, and then the glass sags and takes the shape of the mold. Ah. And you can do incredible things with glass. S sounds very good. We're going to be it's watching good. for Laurie Gates' slump glass glass molds. And thank you very much for being with us, Lori. Thank you, Jen. And thanks for watching us today. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.